Travis, thank you. Travis has been an extremely patient human being. He uh, asked me to do this several years ago. Uh, I said to him in the response when he asked if I could do it on September 11th, I said, what year? And he said, <laughs> he laughed, and I said, no, seriously, what year? As you can imagine, uh, a 9-11 survivor, what's the most important day in our lives when, when everybody wants to talk to you is on 9-11, right? So it tends to be a very, very busy day. But I'm glad, very glad to be able to be here to share this with all of you here at Indiana State University. Um, for the students that are here today, you know what I'm about to say is true. Decisions are important. Decisions are important. They determine what you do, how you do it, when you do it, why you do it. They become the, bat, the, uh, the cornerstones for the characteristics that make up who you are. You have to make big decisions. You know, where do I go to college? What do I study? Um, you know, how long do I stay? Do I go on after undergrad and do postgrad? And you make little decisions. Uh, am I going to have Taco Bell or Burger King? Uh, um, you know, am I going to actually study or, eh, you know what, there's a football game on tonight. Actually, there's two. Okay, so maybe we want to watch that. Um, you know, God forbid if there's a Sycamore game, forget it, okay, studying, what, come on. Um, but we make these decisions in life, and they are the backbone to what makes up our characteristics. Uh, and they're a part of our everyday life. You made the decision to come to this meeting this morning. <clears throat> you came <clears throat> to make the decision to see if you could get something out of this, to meet some friends, to do whatever. The decisions that you make, both big and small, develop our character, and those decisions are heavily influenced by the information we receive and the understandings that we have. The source of the data and the understanding affects our decision-making process as well, sometimes for better and sometimes for worse. And when you're in the midst of a critical decision-making process, we're often thrust into the role of leader, and we're not even really sure how we got there. And now the decisions that you make not only affect you, but they affect others. And your decisions could be truly life and death. It's one thing to have resource and data and information to make your decision, but many times that resource doesn't exist. And you're forced to make a decision with your gut feel. You cannot go with the flow because there is no flow to go with. And that is truly decision making with a twist. So, okay, what makes me some kind of decision making expert? Is it the fact that I make decisions every day on behalf of a multi-million dollar insurance corporation? and those decisions chart our future success or failure? Or was it the decision to marry my best friend 32 years ago? Well, those are certainly important. But most definitely, my decision-making process and my decision-making capability was tried, tested, and galvanized on September 11, 2001. You see, on that day, I was on the 105th floor of Two World Trade Center, the South Tower. And my being here today to be able to speak to you is testament to critical decisions made by many of us in the most dire of situations. So let me share with you how those decisions affected our day and our lives. I'm in the insurance business. I've been in the insurance business for virtually 40 years. Um, I went to Temple University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the city that I was born and raised in. Um, I was a radio and television communications major, so I had absolutely no intention on getting into the insurance industry. For those of you students, this will probably, you won't even understand this, but my goal, my dream job when I graduated from Temple University was to be a disco DJ. That's what I wanted to be, okay? Hey. A disco DJ. Um, but my dad was in the insurance industry, and his dad was in the insurance industry. 
His dad was in the insurance industry. I basically didn't stand a chance. I was going to be in the insurance industry. And actually, that decision has been a good one because it's been a great life for me. It's allowed my family and allowed me to have a wonderful life. It's a good business to be in. Um, if you knew anything at all about the World Trade Centers, one of the things you would realize is that the trade centers were like a mecca for the insurance industry. Virtually every insurance organization in the country, probably in the world, had offices there at the Trade Center. So it was not unusual for somebody in an executive position like me to be asked to go to a meeting there. In August of 2001, Mary Weeman, an extremely powerful woman from the Aon Corporation, a woman who had smashed through the glass ceilings that still unfortunately exist in too many of our businesses today. Mary called me and she asked me to attend a meeting the following month in New York City at the Trade Center. I didn't want to go to Mary's meeting. I had the chance to go to another type of insurance meeting at the same time that involves aluminum or titanium sticks about this long, little metal heads on the end, little white balls in the grass. And you go like this, okay? This is the chance that I had. I had a chance to go to a nice boondoggle. I kind of made it real clear to Mary, eh, I don't know that I can make your meeting. I don't know that I can be there. And Mary, on that phone call, proceeded to do to me what every woman has been doing to me since the day I was born. She threw good old-fashioned Catholic guilt down on my head, okay? Sure, Joe, no problem. I understand. Nobody from uh, CNA will be there. I worked for CNA Insurance Company in Chicago at that time. Nobody from CNA will be there. It's okay. I'm sure it won't be a big deal that your company isn't represented. And she paused for a second and then... She said, don't you know the president of the company? And I said, I report directly to the president of the company. And she said, great, I'm going to see him next week. I'll make sure he knows that you couldn't make it. I said, yeah, okay, I get it. Message sent, I'll be there. I think of my dad every time I talk about this because I thought of my dad immediately at that moment. My dad is one of those fathers that has all kinds of stories. I'm sure none of your dads are like that, right? I mean, story and sayings, most of which I shouldn't repeat here, okay? But anyhow, he had one saying that he used all the time, and it hit me right at that moment. Plan your work and work your plan. Plan your work and work your plan. And I thought to myself, you know what? I can do that. I could go to Mary's meeting. I could go to the golf thingy. I just have to plan it. And so I did. And so the Friday before the Tuesday, I flew back from Chicago to Philadelphia, the city that I was born and raised in. I know you can tell from my lovely North Carolina accent that I'm not from there, okay. Uh, but uh, um, flew back to Philly, visited with my mom and dad on that Friday. And on Saturday, uh, I went and visited my sister, something that if you talk to her today, she'd tell you I don't do enough of, and she's right. And on Sunday, I went to the... Philadelphia Eagles, St. Louis Rams football game, okay? Of course, that's what they were at that point, the St. Louis Rams. I'm sure there's probably some Rams fans or used to be some Rams fans in here. Anyhow, um, I've been a season ticket holder to the Philadelphia Eagles since 1978. <laughs> Something wrong with me, right? <laughs> um I continue to participate in those seats, and my son continues to sit in the seats that I help reimburse, you know? It's a great deal for him. Um, the bank of dad never closes for all the dads out there, okay, just in case you wanted to know. But um, I got the chance to go to the game with my son. My son works for Valero Oil. He works on the pipelines in the deep port in South Jersey. Um, he leads out a team of people if there's an emergency, some kind of a breach or a fire or a, a, a break or whatever. It's a tough job, and he's the leader, so it's double tough work. But my son's my height. He's in great physical shape, but he's a little guy like me, okay? But because of this job, he thinks he's tough guy, thinks he's macho, you know? So it was really interesting that day when we were coming out of the game. We're walking across the parking lot. This kid reaches out, gives me this big giant bear hug in the middle of the parking lot, whispers in my ear, I, I, I miss you, Dad. Push back. I saw a little tear in his eye. I knew he wasn't crying because of the game. The Eagles beat the Rams. Everybody beats the Rams except for yesterday. Um, 
I guess it was a pretense of what was about to occur. We just didn't know that. I got in my car, he got in his truck, I went down to South Jersey, beautiful Marriott Resort in uh, Absica, New Jersey, Seaview Country Club. Woke up on Monday morning and I had that round of golf, had a lot of fun, had a fun lunch with the folks I golfed with. On Monday afternoon, we had a real business meeting. Yep, we really do. Okay. Uh, we were going to have a dinner that night for all the insurance types that were there for this thing. Um, insurance dinners are notorious for beginning and never ending. They just go on forever. Okay. And there's usually a bar involved. Not that any of your students would understand any of that. But um, I said, listen, I can't pull an all-nighter. Can't have all fun. Got to go do what I got to do. Anybody here possibly from New York? Anybody? Yeah, there we go. There we go. Okay. How many people here have visited New York? Yeah, that's even more so. Okay. You know what the New Yorkers and those that visit New York have in common? For sure. None of you want to drive into New York if you don't have to. The traffic is absolutely brutal. Okay. That's what I was thinking about. And I said, you know what? I got a meeting up there. I'm not going to drive into New York City. I'm going to go back to Philly, take a train, that's how I'm going to get there. So that's exactly what I did. At 3.30 in the morning, I woke up in South Jersey, drove back to Philadelphia, 30th Street train station, Amtrak. Got there at about 5.30 in the morning. Um, bought my round trip ticket. Uh, the train pulled in at about 6 a.m. Ran down, well, kind of ran down the steps. Uh, got down into the train, took off my Backpack, I don't carry a briefcase, I carry a backpack. Um, took off my suit coat, took out my laptop, turned my laptop on, sat down in the seat, and did what all of us insurance execs do at 6 a.m. in the morning on the Metroliner train on the way to New York with our laptops on, on our laps. I fell asleep. It was 6 o'clock in the morning, okay? I was tired. Um, and off we went to New York City. And we were about two-thirds of the way up when my cell phone rang. Man, you know what's scary? You look out at this audience today, most of you do not know life without a cell phone. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. You all know that when they rewrite the history books within the next quarter of a century, and the professors here will tell you this, they're going to go down as one of the greatest inventions ever made. They have changed the way we live our lives. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. For those of you here today that remember back in the day, you know what I'm about to say is true. Back in the day, when you were going on a business trip like this, you had to have a plan. It had to be on a piece of paper. Do any of your students still understand paper? Okay. Um, it was usually typed out on a typewriter. I guarantee some of you don't understand that. Okay. And it would have the company that you'd be visiting, the meetings that you were going to have, what times they were on a schedule. It would have the hotel that you'd be staying at. It would show you the room that you were pre-assigned to. It would have the phone number to the hotel that you were staying at so that people could call you. You took a thing called the AT&T long distance card because God forbid you had to pay for these long distance calls. You had to have a plan. Now, with cell phones, wherever you are, that's where you'll be. Just hit me up with a cell phone. Tweet me, text me, do whatever, okay? You can get me wherever you want. It wasn't that different in 2001. Yes, we all had cell phones in 2001. Yep. And before this trip, I had said to my wife, hey, I'm going back to Philly for the weekend. going to actually get the chance to go to a game. Got a meeting in New York on Tuesday. I'll be home Tuesday night. Love you. That's all I said. If you need me, call me. So you thought I forgot where I was in the story. I'm on the train. I'm fast asleep. The cell phone rings. And I answer, and it's my wife. And I very groggily answered, yeah, hello, hello. And she said, oh, my God, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to wake you up. I said, no, 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 that's great. I'm glad you did. Uh, the train's about to pull into Newark. I got to get off. There was a pause. Newark. I thought you said you were going to New York. And I said, yeah, 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 I'm going to New York. But it's a lot easier if you take the PATH train from Newark because it goes right under and stops right at the World Trade Center. And that's where I'm having my meeting today, at the World Trade Center. So that day, I told my wife exactly where I was going to be. 
made my way dutifully off that train with thousands of other New Jerseyans into New York City. When we got to Two World Trade Center, one of the things that amazed me completely, totally blew my mind, were the security people in that building. There were as many as 25,000 people in each of those buildings. Both of those buildings had their own zip code. This is how big of a community this was, okay? And these security people seemed to know who belonged and didn't belong simply by looking at you. No identification, no anything else, simply by looking at your face. I guess the 1993 bombing at the Trade Center made that a reality for them. I walked in. This guy from security, he looks right at me, gives me a little wiggly finger, you know, come on over. I go over to the security desk. I identify myself with my driver's license. Um, he takes my picture electronically. He transfers that picture onto this little white card. And on there is that picture, my name, the company that I am going to visit, Aon Corporation, the floor that they're on, 105, how long the card is good for. The card was good until... Uh, September 12, 2001, and a barcode. Barcode was the most important thing on the card. Not just because it contained all the information I just talked about electronically. That was also the way that you would swipe your way through the electronic turnstiles that separated you from the elevator banks in the building. Both buildings were identical, 110 stories high. 110th in the North Tower, Windows of the World Restaurant. Unfortunately, open that morning. 110th, 107th floors in the South Tower, observation decks. Thank God it was too early that morning for them to be open. The other floors that I didn't mention above 105, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, elevator equipment, elevator cabling, no human beings. We were ready to swipe our way through the electronic turnstiles to get on a bank of elevators to go up to 105, the highest occupied level of the building. Both buildings had three lobbies. One at the ground level, one at the 44th floor, one at the 78th floor. The 44th and 78th floor lobbies were known as sky lobbies. At least back then, and probably maybe even now, and you engineering students could tell me I'm right or wrong, you couldn't engineer elevators all the way up 110 straight flights, okay? So you had these breaks, and on 44 and 78, these sky lobbies were, you, were where you had these breaks where you would transfer on to another set of elevators that serviced a certain set of floors. We went over to 78, big giant elevators, got up to 78, switched off, got up to 105. When the door opened up, much to our surprise, there was Mary Weeman, the woman that had invited me or shamed me to be at the meeting. And it was kind of a surreal moment because there's Mary. And as she's greeting us, I notice she has in one hand a spray bottle of Murphy's oil soap. And in the other hand, she has a rag. She wasn't Susie Homemaker by any stretch of the imagination. But this was how important this meeting was to her. She wanted everything perfect right down to the furniture that she had just been polishing in the internal conference room that she was about to lead us to. That room was probably about a third of the size of the room we're in here today. And somewhat unlike this room, four walls, no windows, one door. The meeting was supposed to commence at 8.30. I've been in the business 40 years. There's never been an insurance meeting that's ever started on time. This day was no different. Everybody's standing around, drinking their Starbucks, talking about the NFL, kids' soccer, anything but insurance, okay? And at 8.48, the lights flickered. That's it. Just a flicker of lights. We couldn't see anything. We didn't feel anything. We didn't hear anything. Just a flicker of lights. Almost immediately a guy by the name of Rick Blood from Aon Corporation, he came bounding into the room. And he said, hey, there's been an explosion in the North Tower. We've got to evacuate. 54 intelligent human beings, all in the same room, all at the same time. We all did the same thing to poor Rick. We looked back at him, waved our hands at him, and said, man, it's New York. Stuff happens. 
We weren't that nice with our language, okay? Stuff happens. Let us have our meeting. And Rick looked at us right back, and he said, no, no, you don't understand. I'm one of those volunteer fire marshals, and I'm for the 105th, the 104th, 103rd floor. I can't get out of here until everybody leaves, and I want to leave. And I know he got everybody out of that room. I was the last guy out. He escorted us all to the nearest fire stairwell on 105. And that's where he proceeded to tell us that we were now going to walk down 105 flights of steps. Oh, yeah, what a bunch of happy campers everybody was, okay? I mean, you know, it, this is unbelievable. We're going to walk down 105 flights of steps. And what ne happened next was really interesting. This was back in the day and age when everybody kept their phones on a holster on their sides, you know, on their belts or whatever, in their pockets. They reached to their holsters or their left or their right pocket. They pulled down their cell phone. We were going to call somebody to moan and groan about the fact that we couldn't have our meeting. Something really interesting happened on the way to the cell phone. This was back in the day and age when everybody had a flip phone. If you still have a flip phone, shame on you. Okay? <laughs> but we all know what the concept was and how they work. You flip them up. See the screen, the screen would come alive, and you would, no service, no service. See, the main cell tower for all of southern Manhattan was on top of the North Tower, the first building to be struck. So cell service was gone. And you're an intelligent group of people learning to do intelligent things as you move forward in life. If you're thinking to yourself, yeah, get on a regular phone, I assume you all know what a regular landline is, right? Okay. I'm, ne I'm never sure with younger people, okay? If you think of that, you get on to that. That would have been a good idea, except think about this. Everybody in New York City are now on those landlines trying to call their mom, dad, sister, brother, aunt, uncle to make sure that they're okay. And even more incredibly, everybody in the world, no stretch, folks, everybody in the world who knows somebody in New York City are now calling in on those same landlines trying to see if mom, dad, sister, brother, aunt, uncle are okay. Cell service gone. Landlines couldn't handle the communication traffic. That's exactly what happened that morning, whether it was winning or unwinning, knowing or unknowing. Lines of communications got cut. So now you've got this group of 54 type A personalities, and they can't even communicate. They can't use their cell phones. So now they're doubly ticked off, doubly angered about what's going on. And I'm sure you're thinking to yourself, my God, didn't you understand what was going on? And that's the point. Every one of you, every one of your parents, everyone in this country that wasn't there knew way more what was going on inside and outside those buildings than any of us that were right there. We had no clue. Not a clue. We began to make our way down the steps. We got down to the 90th floor. The fire stairwell doors in high-rise buildings like this automatically close, don't lock, but they automatically close when there's an emergency. There's signs in there that say, don't leave here except at the lobby level. I know those signs exist. Some insurance geek like me is responsible for those. We got down to 90, the doors propped open. Everybody's filing out onto the 90th floor. But I'm in the fire insurance business. How ironic is that, okay? I'm in the fire insurance business, and I know better. All right, guys, here's your chance. When you were somewhere between the ages of 13 and 17, and your parents told you that you were absolutely, positively not going to do it, what did you do? Amen. Well, you can be 45 and a fire insurance guy and have the same kind of head. I walked out of that fire stairwell onto the 90th floor. I didn't know whether I needed to get to a, another elevator, another bank of, 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 of steps. I, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure. Um, I can tell you that's where I experienced the worst 30, 40 seconds of my life. To look out those windows to the north, to see these gaping black holes through the sides of the north building, gray and black billows of smoke pouring out of those holes, flames redder than any red I had ever seen, licking up the side of the building and beyond the roof level. 
And it was a crystal clear day that day in New York City. Beautiful crystal clear day. And I remember being able to see through the smoke and through the fire and into the huge black holes and seeing pieces of the fuselage of a plane, a large plane, lodged inside the building. And my first thought was, my God, how did the pilot not see this building? How did he miss? He didn't miss. He didn't miss. You see all that. You see furniture, paper, people being pulled out of the building against their will. It was an incredible, awesome, gruesome sight. And I was so afraid. So afraid. I had that feeling that each and every one of us have had. Whether it was yesterday, a week ago, a month ago, a decade ago, you've all had it. Especially you guys. Can't deny that you've had this. Just as much as anybody else here. That pit of your stomach, I want my mommy feeling. I just wanted to go home. I didn't want to be there. I wanted to go home. There were people on that floor with me screaming at the top of their lungs. And yet they seemed to be frozen in fear, mesmerized by what they saw. I knew this wasn't an Xbox game. This wasn't a made-for-TV movie. This was reality. And I was getting out. As I turned around to leave, I almost knocked over a guy who was in the meeting with me, Lud Picaro. Lud was an all-American middle linebacker at University of Pittsburgh back in the day. So he's a huge human being. And I almost knocked him over with my stubby little body because I was in such a hurry. And he looked at me, put his big hands on my shoulders. He said, where are you going? I said, I'm getting the hell out of here. Where are you going? And he said, I'm going to do the same thing. But before I go, uh, I'm going to go. And he pointed to the nearest restroom. That simple decision by Lud that day, the decision to use the restroom, the decision to delay his exit, cost him his life. Simple decision. We got to the top of the fire stairwell. They're making an announcement over the PA system. The event has been contained to the North Tower. The South Tower is considered safe. We suggest that if you work in the South Tower, you return to your workstation. If you feel, if you're a visitor, we suggest that you stay where you are until further notice. If you feel you need to leave, please proceed with caution. I've been doing this for 16 years. Thank you for the look. I always get it, like, how could they make that announcement? Think about this. There's a woman or man in charge of building security in Two World Trade Center. They're down at the lobby level. You know at this point in the event, there's a cop on one side, there's a firefighter on the other side. They're looking back at this person and saying, you can't let them out. It's raining concrete, steel, and bodies outside. You can't let them out. Where are you going to do? Where are you going to put them? And I'm sure this person thought to themselves, wait a minute. Our elevators were going up and down. The electricity was on. The ventilation system was on. Let's just wait and see what's going on. Who would have ever thought that within 18 minutes, the same exact thing would happen to our building? When I got down to the 78th floor, that sky lobby level that I mentioned, Mary Weeman, the woman that I've mentioned several times, she's screaming back at me, Joey, 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 the only other people in the world that still call me Joey or my old Polish aunts. Okay, Joey, I am not walking down 78 flights of steps in these shoes. I'm taking the elevator. She was using a word you never use here at ISU, I'm sure. Um, but that was Mary, strong, leader, powerful. And I see Dave Carlone, senior vice president from Factory Mutual Insurance Company, the best, the finest insurance, fire insurance company in all the world following her to the elevator, Dave, Dave, Dave Carlone. And then I saw Al Kappelman, volunteer firefighter, captain of his company out on Long Island. He worked for Liberty International Insurance Company, following Mary to the elevator. My pea brain finally took over a little bit. I had the common sense to think to myself, man, building, state of duress, fire, emergency, eh, yeah, I know it's not my building. I'm not going to get on an elevator. Arguably the best decision I've made in what is still my life. I was somewhere between the 74th and the 72nd floor when the second plane went through our building. 
we were just a few short stories below the strike zone. That plane went through our building between floors 77 and 83. Never felt anything like that in my life. Never want to feel anything like that again. That fire stairwell that we're inside, this concrete bunker, started to shake so violently from side to side. I'm not an engineer. I can't tell you angles, but it's shaking in ways that it isn't supposed to be shaking. And the concrete spidering out, the handrails breaking away from the wall, the steps like waves in the ocean undulating underneath our feet. We feel this heat ball blowing by us. We smell this jet fuel, and this thing's just rocking back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Felt like forever. Maybe seconds, maybe a minute. And when it finally settled, you would have thought that there would be this craziness, this massive pandemonium, and yet there was nothing but this stunned silence. We all went to grab for our phones again to see if we could communicate. Thank God they didn't work that day. That was truly one of those moments where ignorance truly was bliss. What we didn't know couldn't hurt us at that point. We only had to concentrate on one thing, getting down. Some of the observations on the way down were actually kind of comical. For instance, at one place and one time, I have never seen so many pairs of women's shoes. Now, you think about it. You're 70 flights of steps above the ground level. You're in three or four inch heels, like they say in New York. Forget about it. A lot of barefooted women that day, okay? If you wanted a new laptop computer, that was your day. I mean, there was more electronic equipment ditched to the side than an old bankrupt circuit city store. I mean, there were backpacks, overcoats, briefcases, bags of food, you name it, stuff just ditched to the side to lighten the load. But it was no problem. Two, three, four people wide, egress easy, Anything in your way, you just kicked it out of the way. Everybody was going in the same direction until the 35th floor. That's the chance we had for the first time to encounter the police, the firefighters, and the paramedics from New York City and the Port Authority. Just the looks in their eyes told the story. Just the looks in their eyes. They knew. They knew. They knew that they were going up those steps to try to fight a fire that they couldn't beat. They knew that they were going up those steps to try to save lives that they could not save. They knew that they were marching into the bowels of hell. And they knew that they were going up. And they knew that they were never coming back. They knew. They knew. Could you be that brave? Could you be that strong? Right at that same time, there was a guy walking along with us, a young guy, maintenance guy from the building, brown shirt, blue yoke, name tag over the pocket, a name I never got. He was carrying along with him one of the most annoying inventions God ever allowed us to create, the next telephone with the walkie-talkie feature, okay? And this kid, he'd been walking along with us. This thing had been eerily quiet the whole time down the steps. All of a sudden... We're approaching the firefighters, the paramedics. This thing starts to belch and beep, make all kinds of electronic noise. We hear this voice scream out, we're on 83. We can't get down. We don't know what we're going to do. And this kid, he's to my left, stops dead in his track, spins on the balls of his feet, goes to turn to go back up the steps. I looked over at him and I said, what are you going to do, man? Where are you going to go? And he looked back at me and he said, you know what? I don't know, but I got to save my friend. I submit to you. That nameless maintenance man, that is a true American hero. That man willing to lay down his life to save that of a friend. I can only hope the cops and the firefighters turned that kid around that day. When we got down to the bottom of the steps and you look out 
the arching glass windows in the lobby of the building, you see this twisted steel, crumbled concrete, and big, giant red blotches on the ground, and you knew what those big, giant red blotches on the ground were. They couldn't let us out at the street level. It was raining concrete, steel, and bodies. They took us down into the concourse level of the building, the underground. That's the chance we had when we got down there to see people in real need. Gaping wounds, missing limbs, true blood and gut stuff. But your human nature is such that it makes you want to reach out and try to help, and you couldn't that day. And the reason you couldn't was because there were so many cops, firefighters, paramedics there to help these people. I have never seen at one place in one time such an outpouring of caring, of concern, of love. And that's what this was that day, this total outpouring of love. So the people that needed help were getting the help they needed. Those of us that were on our own, the, you're, you, you, those of us that were okay, you're on your own, and the herd mentality takes over. And you hope somebody at the front of your herd knows where they're at. You're in this rat maze of a concourse underneath the trade centers, carters every which way, stores of every kind known to mankind, signs that mean absolutely nothing to you if you're not from New York, red, blue, green, yellow, uptown, downtown, you have no clue. And this kid in front of our little herd, I hear him yell out, we want to get to the northeastern end of the complex, furthest away from the two buildings. My internal GPS said, you know what, he's right. Follow him. We start to weave our way through that rat maze, as I said, and we're about ready to make our final left to get up to the northeastern end of that complex, and there it is, folks. Starbucks. It's open. There are people in line. I kid you not, okay? Now, I am a card-carrying member of the Starbucks nation, okay? But I don't know where the greatest minds need to be in the moments of crisis sometimes. That just goes to show you. We got up to the northeastern end of the complex. The escalator is no longer escalating. We're marching up these steps. I hear, Joe, Joe, Joe. I turn around. It's David Duffy. David Duffy is the smartest human being I know. David Duffy is my treaty reinsurance broker. For those not business majors, let me explain. Okay. If you think the insurance companies that insure your car, your life, your business, your house, your farm, whatever, if you think they take all the bet, you would be wrong. Insurance companies back their bets on whatever that is with a thing called reinsurance, somebody that supports you. It's done via a contract called the treaty, and it's put together by an intermediary called a broker. David is my treaty reinsurance broker. David is my professional bookie. That's basically what this man is. He backs the bets of my company with his millions of dollars and my millions of dollars that we share together. David's the smartest guy I know. He's calling me. I look behind. I went, oh, my God, Duffy, what are you doing here? And then Dawn, hey, that's right. You work here. <laughs> 54. Why are you behind me, David? And he looks at me and he said, what do you mean? I said, David, you work on 54, right? He said, yeah. I said, I was on 105. You're behind me. Why are you behind me? He says, ah, you don't want to know. I said, I want to know. He says, well, he said, that was about halfway down, about 25 flights down. And um, I realized um, I might not get in the office tomorrow. And I'm in charge of the Yankees tickets for the office. The smartest human being I know went back up 25 flights of steps to get the Yankees tickets. I could have understood if they were Sycamore tickets, but Yankees tickets, my God, wow. But there was a reason for this meeting. Fate was at play. We got outside the building. They're bobcat bulldozing everything. I mean everything. It is unbelievable with these little bobcat bulldozers, and they're screaming at us, run, 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 don't stop, don't stop. You get in front of St. Paul's Chapel across the street from the towers. If you don't know about St. Paul's Chapel on 9-11, after you leave here, do yourself a favor, Google it. It is an incredible, incredible, incredible story. So we get in front of there, we turn around, we see this ticker tape of concrete, steel, and bodies. Unbelievable. David says to me, what are you going to do? Where are you going? I said, you know, I don't know, man. I was supposed to go back to Philadelphia on a train, get in my rental car, drive to the Philly airport, fly back to Chicago. I don't think that's going to happen. He said, you know what? I think you're right. 
he paused for a second and he said, my wife works on the 40th floor in the North Tower. I haven't heard from her. I want to get to my place. Why don't you come with me? I said, okay, where do you live? Upper West Side, 111th. I said, okay. He says, come on, we're going to walk. I said, whoa, that's a long way away. And he said, you got something better to do? And I said, no, 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 you're right. Let's go. We got about um, eight minutes north, eight short blocks in that section of southern Manhattan. Come across a commercial laundry, doors thrown wide open, WINS, the all-news radio station, blaring out that this was an on-purpose terrorist attack. Our jaws just dropped to the ground. Not here. This can't happen here. But it was the next couple of sounds that are the sounds we hear every day. First, the unmistakable sound of the twisting steel and the crumbling concrete of what once was the South Tower, the building that we had been in just eight minutes prior, coming to the ground. Even more hauntingly, the sound of hundreds of thousands of people all Screaming, the blood, same blood-curdling scream, all at the same time. We were really fortunate. David had a friend of his in the Tribeca section of the city. We were able to get into Meredith's apartment. We were able to watch the TV just like everybody else, try to make some sense of what was going on. Giuliani, one of the true heroes of that day, no matter what his politics are today, no matter what your politics are today, true hero of that day, at about five hours in, came on and said, you know, I know everybody just wants to get home. And he was right. And he opened up the subways. Opened up the subways. Because he had enough confidence in his uniforms, in his security, in his police. Unbelievable. David said, come on, we're going. I said, where? He said, we're getting on the train, the subway. I said, oh my God, no, we're not. <laughs> and he said, yeah, we are. We're going up to my place. We got to the subway. It was so packed, we couldn't even get on the first train. And as classic as it can be in New York, by the time we got down the steps and got onto the next train that was supposed to be a local, it became an express, unbeknownst to us. We got two stops up, Penn Station, Amtrak, the way that I had gotten into Dodge, the way that I was going to get out. We both got off that subway train together, looked at each other, never said a word. He knew I wanted to get back to Philly. I looked at him, he looked at me, we got off. When I got into the train station, there's a woman from Amtrak in her finest New York accent. She points at me and she says, where are you going, honey? I said, I need to get to Philadelphia. She says, great, there's a train down here about to take off. And I reached into my pocket to give her my return ticket. I had a round-trip ticket. And she looked at me and she says, are you kidding me, sweetie? We're not collecting tickets today. <laughs> Something's never changed in New York. I know everybody's got to get to class, so let me come to what happened in the next few minutes. I got down to Philadelphia finally on that train. I found my rental car. I had gold. I had a rental car. I decided not to drive back to Philadelphia, or to uh, Illinois at that time, but to stay with my mom and dad. When I got up to northeast Philadelphia to my parents' house, my mom was waiting for me. All you people, especially you gentlemen, Always love your mothers. Love your mothers. There's my mom. She comes off the stoop. She gives me this big, giant hug, pats my head, sobs, my baby, my baby. Didn't have the heart to remind her that I was the oldest one. <laughs> she helped, did for me exactly what she continues to do for me to this day. She helped me, and she loved me. And that's what I needed was my mother's love. Got into the house, slept a few hours, woke up the next morning, called the office, let them know that I wasn't going to be in. It's a good thing they thought I was dead. I know I'm talking to people that eventually are going to be in law enforcement, so forgive me in advance. 14-hour trip in a car back to Aurora from Philly. I did it in 11 and a half hours. I wanted to go home. My wife told me that they were going to have a mass at our local church. I told her I'd meet her there. Pulled down the street to go pull into the parking lot. You would have thought it was Christmas. No room at the inn. I don't know whether I was more afraid the day before, the minute I opened up the back door of that church, to see those hundreds of pairs of eyes all staring back at me. I looked over to the right to the pew where we always sit. We're Roman Catholics. We always sit in the same pew. <laughs> There's my wife 
couple of my kids, a couple of my friends. My wife is the greatest human being ever. She talked to all of you too, whether you wanted to or not. But I know one thing she wouldn't be doing. She wouldn't be up here doing this. This is not her style. She's not that demonstrative. So that's what made it doubly incredible to see that woman jump over the back of the pew, run to the back of that church, give me a hug and a kiss, greater than any hug and a kiss a man could ever want. I knew at that moment that I was home. I was home. There are so many lessons learned in that story that it's hard to recap them all. But, and there are so many as respects decision-making. But the key ones are that every decision is important, no matter how big or how small one may seem. A decision can change your life and the lives of others in ways way beyond that which you can ever imagine. The information, the resource, the trust in your source that you bring to the decision-making process determines the strength and the accuracy of the decision for better or for worse. And the most important lesson, making the right decision is not easy. It isn't easy. But if you trust yourself, your gut, your resources, your heart, your mind, your soul, you can make critical decisions that can have tremendously successful results. I'm here today fortunate to be able to tell you this and to share my lessons learned. But you know what? You don't need to be in a high rise at the 105th floor during a terrorist attack to be that successful, to be that impactful. You can be in a great conference center in a wonderful university on a beautiful September day in Terre Haute, Indiana, and you too, simply by listening and making the right decisions, can have the great effects on your peers and your friends, helping them, helping you to move forward and to maybe even save lives. I don't do this for fame or fortune. I don't do this to cure my heart of what breaks my heart again and again. I do this because I believe as a person who's been part of history, it's my obligation, it's my duty to tell the story, to give a voice to the 3,000 people who lost their voices that day so that they once more be can be heard, and to allow those voices, those those spirits so senselessly dashed that day to once more rise, reminding them, reminding us that while they may have lost their lives, their lives were not lost in vain. I don't seek payment for my speeches. I don't take payment for my speeches. But I do ask for compensation from each and every one of you in one way and in one way only. Always remember Always remember, never, never forget. Thank you, everybody.